that we make to the receiver the radio listener we appeal to the person who creates the piece the artist's subjectivity it has to be harmonic los ingredientes con los que vamos a trabajar son los elementos del lenguaje it has to sound good. It is a completely free genre when it comes to framework. Until this moment, there is no rigid diagram or structure that allow us to design the radio art. You're listening to the noise of the vessels. Recomendamos el uso de auriculares. Recomendamos el uso de auriculares. about that album to me anymore so um oh really yeah <laughs> yeah it's people used to talk about it 10 years ago but now the world has moved on sure My name is Matthew Herbert, and I am a composer, and I do a lot of my composition with sound uh, rather than not traditional musical instruments. Um, I also write film music and books, and I run record labels, and I've been doing this kind of thing for nearly 30 years now, so I'm feeling old.
What can you tell us about the horse? So the horse is a new record for me, which comes out. The first single is out next week, I think, or the 15th, something like that. It's um, a kind of a coming together of a lot of different projects of mine in terms of an electronic component, an orchestral component, a sound component, a technology component. And really what it is, it's, it's a record that tells, tries to tell the story of music or the evolution of music. So the record is made from a horse skeleton. And at the beginning you hear somebody in some Paleolithic caves in Spain with this horse skeleton trying to find the bones and then and then someone picks one up and starts to play one. That's because we uh, had some of the leg bones made into flutes. And so we here start playing this and then we have somebody stretch a rib, one of the rib bones from the horse and stretch a horse hair over it to make a, a bow and then start to play their instrument and um, start to develop harmony. And then we hear melody and then they move to real flutes and you can sort of hear how music evolves. Then we go to amplification and then eventually to electronics and sampling and you hear sounds of musicians triggering the sounds of horses alive. And really, the other exciting thing for me is it's a way of bringing the horse back to life through music. So we start off with a, just a collection of bones and at the end, you hear the horse in a field, eating, drinking some water nearby, has a little run around or something like that, but it's finally free somehow. So it's these two things. It's the story of bringing out, it's the story. So it's two things. So the first is a story of one version of a history of music and the development of technology. And the second one is, is bringing the horse back to life.
mensaje. I mean, you have to tell a story to explain what happens or, or the process of uh, organizing sound, or sometimes you feel some nostalgia about this romantic idea of that, that, that music speaks for itself or something. In your conception and in your relationship with that, has it been like that or has it been different? Um, I definitely don't think music speaks for itself because I think music doesn't just appear to you. It doesn't appear in your head. You know, it comes out of speakers and maybe those speakers are a radio show or maybe you bought a CD or maybe you heard it on a radio, a particular radio station and that person has chosen to play that piece of music then. So I think there's a lot of different forces acting on, on music and how we hear all the time. I think for many people, There's this romantic idea that we're empty and this music just appears into inside of us and we have an emotional reaction to it or not, whatever it might be. But I'm much more of a Marxist. I think that the all the circumstances of how that music reached you and the decisions other people made have an impact on that. So for example, records normally come with artwork. So maybe you picked it up and you saw the artwork or maybe it has a title. My record's called The Horse. So you already know a little something before you start. I do think that in this case, in this particular record for the storytelling, I don't think you need that understanding or that knowledge before you listen to it. You hear bones, then you hear a bone flute, then you hear real flutes. And then eventually you start to hear more and more. It starts to get faster and faster. You hear mechanization music changes and shifts it becomes more electronic more strange and then by the end you hear a horse living so so for me at the beginning you hear a dead horse and at the end you hear a live horse so i think for me it's you don't need the sto everything before and i think for example you can hear all the bones at the beginning but it's they're big bones they're not the bird uh, the bones of a small bird you know they're not the bones of a You know, they're not the bones of a cat. You know, they're, you can hear that they're big. They've got a big, there's lots of them. And so it could be, a, so it's some sort of big animal. And then by the end, you hear a horse. So you think, oh, I guess it's probably a horse. So I think the sounds have a capacity to tell a story. Absolutely.
bones of the horse and not from a, a cow or a similar... I see, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I know this, yeah. The reason it's a horse is, I think, because the horse chose me. I don't think I chose the horse, I think the horse chose me. And um, so that's the first point. But the second, less romantic point is that uh, I wanted to start with an animal skeleton. And I wanted to start with the biggest animal skeleton I could buy. And on eBay, the biggest skeleton I could find was a horse. So I was like, okay, let me, and I'll show you, a, a, let me show you a picture of it. So this is the picture from eBay. I'll put it in the, in the chat. This is the photograph from the eBay listing for it. And when I looked at it, I was like, Oh my God, it's a musical instrument. Already, you know, it just looks like a musical instrument. It looks like a piece of music. It looks, it has rhythm, texture, shape tension so when yeah. i saw that i was like okay this is this is my animal and i bought it i still have it and it still smells quite bad in the studio <laughs> <laughs> but this is you know this is music you know which is a drum is made from a skin of an animal hit with a piece of wood you know like uh, flutes were just air passed through bits of bone and strings for guitars were made from the guts of sheep, you know, the stomach of sheep and things like this. So we have this, the materials of music are very bound up with animals. We wouldn't necessarily have music if it wasn't for other animals. Also, presumably birds sang before we did. I don't know. That's an interesting point. I'm going to look that up later. But, um, but yeah, we don't, We, yeah, we have this very, very colonial relationship with the natural world, with music, the same as everything else. We take what we want and we don't really think about the history or the consequences of that decision. You don't see dogs making music out of cats, you know what I mean? It's a very human thing to take another animal part and it's a very uh, violent thing, you know, this violence is, is there. And in a way, part of what this record is about is thinking and, and saying thank you, I guess, in part to these animals that, have, that we've hit over the years and blown through and scraped and, to generate music. No, I feel that strongly. I, I really feel that. Particularly making a record like this, it became very ritualistic. It became very spiritual. I absolutely recognize that that conversation that you should have, you know.
es el mensaje
Well, I'm a disciple of John Cage, so I, I don't really believe in silence. I don't, I'm not really sure it's a, I'm not sure really it's a thing. But I, I think there's something, um, there's a real danger with sound and audio, which is that when we're working with it, we're recording. You might have a spike. You know, we actually look at it on a waveform, you know, where something happens, like, ah, oh, something happens, and then and then nothing happens after it. So we get, get our computer scissors and we chop the bit before and the bit after. So we just have this, as you know, it's called a transient, but, you know, yeah. that this little event, this little bit of drama. And we take that and use that to manipulate or to make sound or music with. And for me, this is just one small part of the story, you know. There's all this other information in the silence that comes after the sound or, you know, I'm, part of what I like working with sound is it's a sort of a quest for truth or a quest for understanding to a new understanding of listening to the world. And, um, and so I, I worry that if we just take the transients or we just take the spikes, then we're missing the whole, the whole picture. So, for example, I did an album called A Week in the Life of a Tree and then put microphones in the top of a tree pointing out, so listening to what the tree would hear. And we listened for one week continuously, 163 hours of recording from the perspective of a tree. Now, to make that into a smaller work, you would just take the, the really big moments, like the thunderstorm or like the bird landed next to the microphone and started singing loudly or somebody shouted at the bottom or whatever. But actually, that's not the real experience of the tree. The ex tree experienced a whole variety of different things. And I don't want my life or just to be about the transients, just to be about the drama, if you like. But it's also about the gaps in between. It's also, you know, that's the really difficult thing about living, right? Is the cleaning your teeth every day and having to cook three times a day and having to take your children to school every day and to clean your socks. You know, that's, it's not just going to concerts and great movies or revolution or writing a book or or having sex or whatever it might be. It's all the other stuff as well. So I think for me, that's when I started working with sound and recording, I was always interested in just the drama of the sound, but now I want the whole picture. I want what comes afterwards and the quiet parts and, as well.
definitely think you're missing information. I really think that. I mean, particularly because the tree is in, has roots that are at least as big underground as, as the sure. tree is tall. Sure. So you have this whole, whole network and it's pulling in water and communicating and it's feeling footsteps and things. So it's definitely missing, we're definitely missing information. But I think we haven't tried to think like a tree, really. I mean, the scientists have a little bit, but um, recently some books that I've been reading. But one of the things that I, I wanted to do was to make a piece of music for a tree. And this starts to be a really interesting question for me. is like, well, what would a tree want to hear? Like, does it want to hear birds? Probably not, because it hears birds every day. Does it want to hear wind? No. Does it want to hear other trees? Maybe not. Does it want to hear Nina Simone? Maybe. Does it want to hear a V12 engine? Maybe. You know, does it want to hear laughter? Does it? Maybe not. Does it want to hear humans? You know, I was thinking, I realized the other day that daytime is very dangerous for trees because humans come and chop them down during the day. You don't get attacked during nighttime, really, as a tree. And um, so the daytime is like a, a period of danger for these, for, particularly in a forest that's managed by humans or something like this. So I really enjoyed thinking about this, about like, well, what kind of music would a tree want to hear and trying to think about starting to make it. Not just a tree, but, you know, what would a dog like to listen to? You know, what would what would your house like to hear? What kind of music would your house like to hear? Would it like silence or would it like activity? Would it want to be, you know, if your house lives by a main road, want all the traffic to stop? But anyway, I like this because it it stops us being complacent with how we listen because we're very very narrow listeners still, you know.
Gerardo, algo, algo. Yeah, I have, to, I have one more question, and it has to do with the going back to to the to the the, the choices of nature and the relationship with nature, because I was wondering about what what you said about the trees and and the birds, and really birds have been singing louder and louder throughout practically centuries even to the point of being of being as audible as motor cars for example this is the same as dogs dogs are barking as loud as motor cars sometimes um so in that sense i was, I was wondering if you've had some sort of idea or, or, or if you have a sort of uh, ideal sonic landscape and if you have what what, what would it be like It's difficult because, of course, the thing you want is, or the thing that you feel that you want is you want calmness and peace somehow. So, of course, you know, I would want to, it'd be nice to be near a small river, for example, you know, and just hearing the water go over the stones, that would be very nice. But actually, to be truly calm for me is to be with my children you know my children to be nearby maybe one of them is reading a book maybe one of them is playing the piano and maybe i'm reading not far for me it's a much more constructed landscape in a way it's it's much less about the kind of textural quality of sound because i think nature has a real problem which is If you stand on an incredible mountain and watch the sunset, you feel like everything is going to be okay somehow, or like it feels restorative or, but actually, you know, nature's in crisis, you know, we're in crisis. And how do you, I think one of the hardest things to hear is sounds that aren't, are no longer there. You know, how do you hear the sound of a tree, trees that weren't, aren't there anymore because they were cut down or how do you hear birds a type of bird that is is now extinct has now gone extinct that used to sing there you know there used to be maybe a, a different river that used to pass over there which and now we're just left with this little trickle well this is a small little amount of water but actually it was a beautiful waterfall 20 years ago before we poisoned the landscape or before a farm that up there i find it difficult to settle in nature because it's You can also hear the the violence or the destruction or the absence or those kinds of things as well. And actually, calmness for me maybe comes from knowing that my family is safe. I think maybe right. that's the, that's maybe the safe and happy. You know, that's maybe the thing that I would like to hear. Great. I, I was expecting a sort of Cajun answer in, in, in terms of this uh, praise of the traffic or something of that sort. Yeah. And I'm very impressed by that answer. So thank you very, very much. It, it, no, that's and, okay. That's okay. I never know whether to listen like John Cage and accept the traffic or listen like Chomsky and uh, hate the system that has brought us all this traffic and all this pollution and all these problems. So uh, I never know whether I'm listening. As, as with my Chomsky hat or my cage hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's the best answer. Getting the right hat for the right moment or, yeah. and, and the right, to get the right listen moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, cool. Very good. Okay. Um, well, Gerardo, algo más? Tenés... No, no, no. Estoy okay. super bien. Sí, muy agradecido. Sí. Okay. okay. Dr. Herbert, thank you, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good luck with the station and everything. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Take care. El ruido es el mensaje.
Vamos por más, dice la rana, escúchame. ¿eh? Esto recién empieza. 